Thank you again so much for uh, for doing this. We really appreciate it. Yep. Well, if I had to go out there, I wouldn't do it. But it's, uh, <laughs> my, my bedroom, That's my bedroom it. is ten feet we, away. Right? I just, we, really, uh, on Saturday, uh, we're just barely waking up here. Yeah. All righty. So now I'm going to do a share screen. Let's see what happens here. So you let me share the screen already? Yep, you should be able to. Okay, you're right. You are correct. I think that's the one I share, right? It's coming up. That's good. You see the slide now, right? You do. Yep. Okay, then Kristen can now see. Okay, okay, great. Um, so let's get started. Uh, thanks a lot, Sean. Yeah, by the way, it's, I'm, I'm, I'm still kind of cold here <laughs> because, you know, we, we, we leave our heater on at 60 degrees when we go out uh, and sleep at night. And then on Saturdays, it, the thermostat doesn't come back on until nine. <laughs> so uh, it's a little cold. It's okay. I'll warm up. All righty. Hey, uh, thanks a lot for allowing me to come and guest speak. And for me, it's early. For you, it's uh, 11. No, 10, 10, so 10 isn't bad. So you guys even got out there in the cold at, at 9 o'clock. That, that's pretty good. So I, I, Probably the restaurant's nice and warm. But anyway, let's get started here. Um, today we're going to talk, anyway, my name is Ed Fong, and um, I normally teach at uh, UC Santa Cruz, uh, mainly in the graduate school. I teach uh, three classes now, uh, high-speed interface class, uh, RF antenna design class, and a uh, communications class. Oh, yeah. Uh, radio circuits, uh, modulation theory, and stuff like that. But today we're going to talk about antennas, and what we're going to talk about in particular uh, is how how you what's the basic fundamental way of getting a single band J pole working a dual band without the degradation and performance that you would normally get. And we'll we'll review this. So it's about a fifty minute talk, and we're open to questions. And later on, Zoom's really difficult to to break with questions right in the middle, so it's easier just. Try to make a note of the questions, and then we'll, we'll have a session at the end for, for questions and answer. So what I'm going to talk about today is this uh, design we came up oh, probably 20 years ago. Now, we've made improvements on it, but the basic fundamental design um, was back in February 2003. Um, but then we've made little modifications on it, and it's a pretty well-accepted design. I think the ARRL has two of our dual band versions that they've tested. They've got one of our tri band and also two of our tri bands. So they like this design. And a lot of people have, uh, it's hard to build, but a lot of people have this. We've sold probably a little, in 20 years, about 40,000 of this design to folks, um, commercial and hams, about 40,000. So it's pretty well, well accepted. It's, it's so well accepted. It's in the ARRL Volume 3 Antenna Compendium, Volume 8. Uh, it's also in the Antenna Classics, and somebody tells me, told me that it's even in the uh, regular handbook that they, they've added that in. So it's a pretty good design. I'm, I'm not sure now. I'm not sure whether you can go out and build it that easily without a good network analyzer. Um, it's tough to build, but again, we offer it here. Uh, that's how we kind of fundraise for our, our uh, classes, our, our students here. Um, so we'll, we'll give you the details that you can purchase this at a very reasonable price from us, and that's why I kind of give these talks. Otherwise, why would I get up at uh, 7.30 on a Saturday morning? <laughs> if it wasn't for that, I wouldn't get up. Nope, nope, nope. My, my students don't realize how tough I, things I do, the things I yeah, do. They are reasonable and they do perform well. I have three different versions of your antennas that I use. Yeah, so. and, it, and the principles are quite simple. The trick is getting the right materials. You know, we measure, we have really, really good measuring equipment here, all HP and Keysight stuff. <laughs> spectrum analyzers, network analyzers, and a really good calibrated uh, antenna range. And um, so the principles are pretty easy to understand. I think trying to get all the details, making sure the, the twin lead you get is commercial grade twin lead. We special order that to our specifications. Uh, even, the, even the coax lead in we use is all special custom made for us. And I, I can explain that in a while. Uh, you know, 0.1 dB, 0.3 dB here, it all adds up. And that's why people say, but your antenna just performs well. Uh, it does. It does compared to other antennas. Um, you know, if, if you just specify something as coax, RG58 or whatever, no, it's more than that if you're building an antenna because all the little losses uh, make up. Uh, they all build up. Okay, let's get started here. So um, what I'm going to talk about today is this one right here, basically. 
this is the, the original article, the front page article we did in 2003. Uh, so you can tell it's inflation, right? You can build this for less than 10 bucks. Mm, yeah, maybe you still can if you can scrounge up the parts, but it'd be tough, the time you take. Subsequently, we did a roll-up portable version. That was uh, like a couple of years later. One of my students said, hey, you know, this is a really cool concept. Can't you put this all in a little uh, plastic bag and you know, nice and light for both emergencies and camping? And we did that. Uh, but the principle is the same. Again, the dimensions would be different because it operates in air as opposed to yeah. PVC pipe. But we'll show you that in a while. And then the last article I did with my daughter when she was about five years ago, uh, she's got a, uh, this is before she went to engineering school, right? I think she was a senior in high school, KJ6 QXM. This is the tri-band, how we added 220 to it. So are, you guys have uh, 220 repeaters out where you're at? Not really. Not really. Okay, so uh, it's an interesting way. So the, the 220 came about because FEMA said, we love your antenna, but can it do 220? Because it would solve a big problem for us in that we don't have to carry an extra 220 antenna. You make dual band antennas, but you know, FEMA um, does most of their packet on 220 because then it doesn't interfere with the uh, VHF and UHF uh, bands. Um, so they said, if you can make it all in one antenna, it'd be great. Then we don't have to add any hardware to our um, inventory when those FEMA trucks, FEMA disaster trucks, because despite what some hams think, FEMA is not in the communications business. They're in the disaster recovery business. So they want things as simple as possible. They got enough problems. So that's how we got the tri-band. Uh, and my daughter now has got a bachelor's and master's degree in mechanical engineering. And then she's also got a degree in uh, mechatronics, which is electronics and mechanical engineering. So yeah, she's doing pretty well. Um, okay. And then subsequently, um, we've had, we patented the tri-band and you know, I also, have, uh, have a patent on how to get gain out of a collinear. A lot of people are just curious. It performs pretty well, but how do you get gain out of it? Can you make it into a collinear? So I looked into that. Actually, I looked into that from a grant. We had a grant from uh, ATD Alarms. Uh, that's another story of why ATD Alarms uses a mesh network these days. Right? I don't know in your area whether, whether they've um, upgraded or not. You know, the old ATD Alarms, you have a phone line coming into your house. And if uh, once something triggers that, that automatically goes back and there's a central office somewhere, they get a ring and then uh, they, they see whether there's a fire or a burglary. Uh, the problem with that was, uh, you know, over the years when they, when they gave us a grant for this, can you develop us a really cool antenna for a cheap price for UHF? And how that came about was because they said, like, well, why, you know, you're ATD, don't you use telephone lines? We really want to get away from telephone lines. Uh, the, the, the one liner was like saying, we, we basically, ATD Alarms was a collector of money for the phone company for 30, 40 years. They said, you know, the bill you pay, $12, $15 a month to ATD, you think you're giving it to the alarm? Yeah, half of it has to go to the phone company. They were charging so much. And so they decided to invest, uh, this is probably 15 years ago. Um, yeah, 10, 15 years ago. So, you know, we got to get away from this. We can't be the collection agency for the phone company. And also, you know, people can cut wire, those wired lines and all this. So they developed their own mesh network. Uh, when you, if you happen to have an ATD fire or burglar alarm now, you notice if it's a modern one, you notice there's a little box either in your garage or in your laundry room with a little rubber duck antenna. Yeah, they use UHF and a mesh network in a city. So you, they're all digital, so they talk to each other and then get, they get to a central office. And that's why they needed, the, for the weaker people, they needed an outdoor antenna. And that's what we developed for them. So I gave a talk on that. And then I, I published that in CQ, um, made a ham version. They were 465 UHF um, and you know, hams are 445. So I modified and published a version, a ham version in CQ. Um, so, so anyway, the, why do we patent this? Uh, originally I didn't, but uh, on, on the one we presented today, I just did it for the hams. <laughs> the thing is people started copying it. Not only that, the people start copying it, they start selling it. And that was even okay, except that we started buying them and they weren't very well made. They made it out of cheap materials. They didn't work very well. And I, uh, and that was even maybe marginal. I said, you just let them do whatever they do. And I, I think the, uh, really broke the straws and camel back was when they start saying, buy the Ed Fong antenna, published in QST. And they were making and making all the money. And, and, and again, 
what bothered me was it wasn't they were the ones that I saw weren't very good. I had some of my students buy them. I go go buy because obviously they were recognized my name. We evaluated. They were lousy. They were resonating at one fifty five, uh, mostly high. I remember one fifty two. Not in the ham bands and it went dual band. The UHF was all off and they just took our dimensions and just built it. Well, you can't do that. It has a lot to do with the velocity factor and the materials you use. So we'll get into that today, that you just can't build this thing just like that. It may be, seem simple in principle, but building it is tough. So that's why we patented it, uh, this thing, so people can't uh, copy us. Well, at least we have some legal standing on it. All right, so why why did I use a, I started with a J-pole. Uh, this problem came about again back in the 2000 era. And we have swap meets, like probably you guys have swap meets. People get together and uh, talk. And then, you know, by, by 2000, they had a lot of dual band handy talkies, dual band mobiles were coming out. Um, they're really phasing out a single band mobile. You know, if you're going to buy a VHF radio, why not get UHF with maybe $50 more? Most people think, I'll take $50 and get dual band and repeaters. A lot of UHF repeaters were coming on. So people were asking, hey, we need a good antenna. And, and yeah, you could have bought them. You know, you know, Diamond sold them, uh, Comet sold them, uh, Larson sold them. But their uh, base station antenna wasn't cheap. You know, another Back then, it was $100. Today, it's you know, a good a good dual band antenna is $150 to $200. So they were asking me, well, my J-Pole works well. Uh, is there any way you can make a dual band one? And let me choose tell you why we chose the J-Pole. J-Pole is a very good antenna. Uh, I remember when I was growing up, uh, you know, we did ground planes, ground planes and dipoles on VHF and certainly dipoles on HF. But if you look at a photo here, this is interesting. I took this photo uh, three, four years ago, uh, climbing up to a mountain up in San Francisco. That's Sutro Tower. That's their main tower in the city. Look at this antenna tower. I mean, it costs millions to build this, I'm sure. But there's not a single antenna here. There's not a single antenna here that has radials. Remember in the old days, antennas would be ground planes with radials. I can't see a single one with radials. That's because I believe that most are all a J-Pole design now. In 20 years, when j poles came around, the design is so good, it gives you about, oh, 1.6 dB gain over a ground plane. And on top of that, it has no radials. You know, the problem with radials, when things stick out, right, it, it um, prevents a, a wind load and also uh, um, a torque. You know, in other words, let me, hang on, I'm in the wrong room. I'll grab one of these antennas and I'll show you. Hang on, hang on, just hang on one moment. Possible the tower going on. Or if I read it off, oh, or frequency of the antenna doesn't require it. Okay, I'm back. <clears throat> See, for instance, if you have radios, it's like Here's a PVC pipe. I can hold it up vertically very easily because there's no nothing called R cross F. The distance is zero if you're a mechanical engineer. But a radio has to hold horizontally like this, and that's much harder to hold. If you have three of them, over time they'll fall off. And sometimes birds will go on top of them. and uh, It's just terribly unreliable in the wind. So when this design came out with the J-Poles, it started getting popular commercially, and, and Hams also adapted it. Um, it. It grew popularity really, really quick. I mean, the only the disadvantage is it's taller. So what it's taller? The weight is vertical. You don't feel it. And it holds up much better. But I tell you, I, um, a real gain of it is this. The design I'm going to talk about today, it's what's called a DC shorted design. So I'm sure a lot of you already use J-Pole designs. I, I don't see very many people use ground plane or dipole designs anymore. Um, I'll, let me get into it. It's a DC shorted design. That means you really put it this way. If you've got one of these J-pole type designs, and I'm sure a lot of you do, I hope you don't have a lightning arrestor. 
on it. You don't need a lightning arrestor. You can't beat it. You put an ohm meter across it, it's a DC short. It's not an AC short. Obviously, it resonates at 146 megahertz and 445. When you put an impedance meter, you know, a network analyzer, over 50 ohms or close to it. But when you put a DC meter across it, it's a DC short. It's always discharging. It cannot hold a DC charge. So as long as you, uh, you know, the shield obviously is grounded on your collection. You tie the shield to, to, to the antenna, and it's grounded. It, it cannot hold a charge. It's DC short. Um, well, here's yeah, here's an example of a, a dipole. Um, took this picture years ago. Here's, I'm sure it works fine. It's a dipole antenna made of copper pipe. You've got the radiating element and the shield element right there. And then there's a little insulator in there, a little Teflon insulator. And if you look at this, uh, can you get it to work? Or you actually can get it to work quite well. Electromagnetically, you can. But mechanically, it's sort of compromised, extremely compromised, in fact. Here you have a dipole, and you have this encoding. That's going to act as a reflector. Any conductive mass would act as a reflector. And... If you don't want the reflected again, the way in this case, you know, without even doing a simulation, you know the wave is going to go this way, because that's going to act as a reflector. So that's not good. And how do you minimize that? Well, you make this arm further and further out, get this section further and further away from the mass, and its effect is going to be less and less. But you can't mechanically, because I can tell the this antenna will not last. Because this held, it's held together by solder, right? There's a T connector with solder. And you guys know solder is very soft. It's not a weld. A weld would hold, but solder does not hold. Solder's electrical, it's not mechanical. You need to solder, it's really soft. If you had this antenna further out, in fact, the way it is done now, I bet you it wouldn't last very long in the winds. You'll rock this thing back and forth, back and forth. Eventually, mechanically, that joint there will break apart. And so it, it, you just can't use this on, on a mountaintop. And it, you can't even use it in a home. Eventually, it falls apart. I've, we've tried these. And now that, you know, just feeding it at 90 degrees is, is very tough. Well, feeding it on the bottom like a J-pole is very easy, and it lasts. Uh, so let's see. Yeah, so no radials. And you don't need a DC lightning arrestor. And that's, you know, $30, $40 for a ham. A good commercial lightning arrestor is about $100. So I, that's why I like it. It's N-fed. Oh, whoops. Ah, I'm moving this around too much. Yeah, it's N-fed. It's very close to an ideal pattern, um, uh, ideal uh, half-wave pattern. A ground plane does not. A ground plane has radial, so the angle of radiation is not quite as low. You get a little lower angle of radiation out of a vertical dipole, but it is taller, there's no doubt. And so the, the J-pole design is not that practical for HF because it's a it's only it's a half wave vertical and a quarter wave matching stub so it is quite tall but again at VHF and UHF at UHF is really reasonable a quarter wave at UHF is only six inches so it takes two half waves and a quarter wave so it's at UHF eighteen inches at uh, VHF oh it's more like fifty five inches. Still reasonable, so it's not like 19 inches anymore, but it's vertical. Vertical, you'll find it's, it's pretty convenient if you played around with these. So, okay, let's move on here. So, anyway, I was first introduced to this antenna, and it, I'll look, get into it. It looks like that, but I'll explain how it works in a while. But I was introduced to it in the 1990s, and I, I really liked it. Uh, the dual band thing didn't come about until later on. Um, but I like the simplicity of it, and it, 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 I was introduced to it in the 300 ohm twin lead, and took it home. Uh, my friend Denny gave it to me. He said, "Hey, try this." He, uh, I don't know where he read about. It. He read about it somewhere, and certainly it worked. I said, "But it would work better if we can stick it into a PVC pipe, and then make it into a base station." It was just twin lead, and it wouldn't last very long outside in the wind. But the principles work. So let's stick it into a good PVC pipe. It's new stuff that's out, you know, UV protected. They say it will last for 30 years. And uh, yeah, and that, that kind of all started this idea. And yeah, we've sold approaching on 40,000 now, quite, quite a bit. Let's see. Oh, so by 2000, so I'm, I'm playing around with this stuff. And I, I have one in, at, at my house. And uh, I they're easy to build. They're cheap. 
certainly I took out the ground plane I was using. I was convinced this is a pretty cool design. Uh, but by 2000, when all these dual band repeaters and dual band handy talkies, dual band mobile start coming out, people started asking questions saying, you know, we, we want an antenna that can do UHF. And what they found was, well, either the ground plane or their J-pole worked. And the first thing you check, what happens, what happens if I put that uh, UHF, uh, that's this new handy talkie, whatever that does UHF, let me just test the SWR on the antenna I have. Turned out it was okay. Uh, better than what would expect. He said, wait a moment, I'm going to use this at UHF and I only have a VHF antenna. Um, does it work? And they thought it kind of worked. The SWR was reasonably uh, acceptable. In other words, if I get a typical VHF J pole or ground plane tuned for two meters, one, you know, 146 megahertz or so, and tuned it to uh, 445. Actually, it won't be that bad. It won't be perfect, but it'll be like 1.5. The experiences I've had, you know, 1.3, 1.5, 1.6 to 1. Nothing that would burn out your radio. Very acceptable. So a lot of folks started using it that way. And you could. There's, I, I don't think there's any problem with using a VHF antenna on UHF. The reason why it works is if you study antenna theory, virtually all antennas will resonate at their odd harmonics. So what do I mean by that? I mean, if you make a dipole, a typical dipole or ground plane at 100 megahertz, and you have a little network analyzer, you know, one of these, uh, you know, one of these things here, like a nano, nano VMAs, 100 bucks. I think everyone should get one for 80 to 100 dollars. It does so many cool things for that money. Um, so if you made a dipole at 100 megahertz, uh, you'll find that you'll see dips at odd harmonics, 300, 500, 700. Etc. It won't go on forever. Not that the theory doesn't say it won't. Your, your materials, right? Your coax losses, the materials that you're using will have too high losses. So it'll be limited to that. I mean, I mean if you simulated it on like Easy Neck or uh, ADS or one of these RF antenna simulators and assume no losses and that your um, performance of your transmission lines are still good in, onto infinity, you'll see it. You'll, you'll, you'll see a 100 megahertz dipole or ground plane go you know, 300, 500, you see these dips in SWR. So people notice this, well, the SWR is fine, but you quickly notice if you use a VHF antenna at UHF, it's pretty poor performance. In actual performance, it's about, oh, yeah, six to eight dBs of loss. That's a lot. You know, you only It's only about a quarter performance at UHF that you expect from a UHF dipole or UHF ground plane using a VHF antenna. So you don't want to use a VHF antenna at UHF. The good news is it's not going to blow off your radio. The bad news is you'll really notice the performance. With a local strong repeater, you're okay. But handy talkie to handy talkie, you'll really notice quick that it does not work very well. You know, maybe at a swap meet where you're talking to someone down the street, fine. But you'll quickly notice it won't go more than a few blocks you can you're, you're losing about six to eight dbs so my task was talk to talking to these folks back in 2000 can you modify these uh, jpo antennas which we liked a lot of folks said this is a great antenna about one and a half dbs better than a ground plane but we would love it to also work on uhf because we have dual band radios now so what i determined was whatever i did it had to be simple, reproducible. And again, you can't add radios. The whole purpose of the JPO is not to have radios. And so we're going to talk about how we did it. Uh, okay, yeah, no, whatever we did, the constraints, no inductors you have to buy. You can't have capacitors in matching. By the way, that, that's a typical rule. I, I do a lot of commercial an, antenna designs. Um, and, you know, when I open up a lot of ham antennas, these comets and diamonds, Boy, no wonder, you know, they, they have great ideas of a 258. A 258 should perform really well, but they have a problem with matching. They end up matching it. They need to match it back to 50 ohms, and they typically use capacitors. Oh, I know in the X200, there's two, it was like a six picofarad and a 10 picofarad ceramic capacitor, ceramic capacitor to, to get the matching right. And, you know, you RF guys, come on, you can't. A ceramic capacitor at UHF? Put a ceramic capacitor, measure it on a network analyzer. 
a 10 pico fare. It is not 10 pico fare by the time you get to UHF. There's series inductance with it. There's losses with it. It has a self resonance. They totally destroy it. Their concept of a dual five eighth in, in, in the cases where I've seen. And we've tried, you know, at the university, we can test all kinds of things. We have, I bought four of the X200s on different times. Maybe it was a production problem. They said, no, no, we'll buy four different areas at four different times. They all performed the same. The SWR was okay, not great. It was okay, 1.5 to 1, acceptable. But when we measured it in actual field performance, and by the way, we're not the only ones that have done this. Other clubs told me about this. They said, you realize that your antenna, as simple as it is, at a, you know, one quarter of the price, when we did field tests, it performed just as well as the X200 by Diamond. I said, really? That's when I got curious. I started buying some and started tearing it apart. And yeah, they, they use, to match, they use, there's a six picofarad and a um, 10 picofarad ceramic. It's, it's not even like a mylar because that would be more expensive. And, you know, you take one of those caps, they've got self res They're terrible. You just, it, it, they're not really designed to operate above 30 megahertz. You, know, you, you, you measure 10 picofarads at 10. Usually, uh, you know, these, these uh, capacitor meters will give you a choice of 1 megahertz or 10 megahertz because it depends on the frequency. Because the capacitor, when you say 10 picofarads, is only usually good at low frequencies. As you go up, it changes. It, it's usually more capacitance and has a lot more losses. And in order to get VHF, UHF, you have to get a Mylar or chip cap. You know, those are more expensive. So anyway, we tested this. They were absolutely right. Our antenna, our simple antenna, it performed just as well. And of course, we analyzed this in one of my classes. Why? And if you're an antenna designer, you don't do this, you don't do this. Now, it's interesting to note that uh, and we have repeater antennas. Of course, I do antennas for a living. So we look at all these, you know, the, the cell waves and the commercial Motorola's. Uh, and those work really, really well. Those don't have capacitors. They are a different design. When they claim 6 dB gain, yes, they can outperform our antennas for sure. Uh, but those are you know, $800 to $1,000 antennas. Those are very, very good ones. Um, and we've taken those apart. Um, so anyway, we all the, the idea of this talk was, how do you get dual band out of this thing without the degradation of performance? So anyway, no, no capacitors that you have to buy, no inductors you have to buy. You, you couldn't guarantee them. You know, people would buy them, but then, then, then it kind of uh, ruins your reputation. We tried this and it doesn't work. Yeah, it probably doesn't work. So I, it had to be simple, something you could do. Uh, you would need a network analyzer, a good SWR meter. Uh, and um, you can build and, and, and prove to yourself that the concept works. And that's why QST published it. It's something you can read about. If you have some experience, you can build with some patience. Or you can buy from us. I'd rather you buy from us. <laughs> you, you buy from us. You help out the students. You, you give us something to do. And, you know, we, we, ra we raise quite a bit of funding from this, by the way. We, we do quite well. I don't have any other grants or anything. We just strictly, this is what we do. And, they, you know, I get them coming over twice a week at my house. And working. We can't do it at the university because then we have to give money to the university. Uh, but, okay. So what's wrong with a, using a regular antenna a regular two meter ground plane or J-pole, they'll all have this pattern. So this is an easy neck uh, simulation, one of these free software things you can do. And, and this is a half wave dipole sitting uh, simulated in free space, right? It's a good reference, just free space. Obviously, if you actually measured this, it wouldn't be this way because you wouldn't be in free space, but it's a good reference. Where, here's the sky. So this is called an elevation pattern angle. Here's the sky, here's the earth, here's sea level right here, sea level right here. So the concept is that you're sitting there transmitting and then the other guy, your guy in a walkie-talkie or whatever is walking around here. And a half wave antenna, could be a dipole, could be a J-pole, radiates like this, like a figure eight, which is great because when you look at it from the sky, it's 360 degrees, it's like a donut. And you don't, uh, radiate energy into the sky because you don't, you don't want to, right? You want most of your energy at sea level ground. So a vertical dipole actually works quite well. A well-designed, well-built vertical dipole really works quite well, except at its third harmonic, like what I said in the, in the oh, someone's calling me. That's okay. At the third harmonic, uh, I wonder if I should answer that. Hang on, my phone's answering. Hang on, hang on, hang on. Wow. Who's talking to 
I should have pulled the side around to get the light back on the side. No. <laughs> I get antenna antenna phone calls on a Saturday morning. <laughs> Thank you. Sorry about that. So back to this talk. So it turns out that at vertical dipole at VHF, the UHF pattern looks like this. Not the SWR. The SWR is okay. Here's the sky. It turns out 75% of the energy goes up into the sky. And you're only left with about 25% of where you want it. So our antenna is okay if you're talking, you know, if you're talking to the International Space Station, to an airplane, it's okay. But typically we're always talking to somebody back at sea level or close to it. Stay and that's your energy lobe. That's what we want to get rid of. So it's not a matching problem. It's an this energy way, distribution. Less ripple in this. Sure. So let's see how we get rid of that. Let's see how we now. Why does that exist? I'll tell you. It's very simple. Without the math, it exists because in a J pole, and it's like in a J pole design. In a J pole design, um, here's the half wave. Here, this is twinly. I'm just modeling it's twinly. So this, is, this, this side you don't use. In a J pole, that that is the half wave, right? That part here. Normally, in a dipole, we would have fed it in the middle like this, right? In a normal dipole, you would have fed it in the middle. In a J-pole, we feed it at the end, and I'll explain how we do it in the end. So, so let me explain something real quick. So I don't know how familiar you guys are with Smith charts. You, you don't have to be an expert here, but I think what the Smith chart shows is any piece of coax you have that shorted, if you short circuit a transmission line, a quarter wave later, which is 180 degrees, it becomes an open. This is not like DC, right? DC, if you short one end of a piece of coax, what's in the other? It's a short. But when you talk about AC waves, uh, it's different and it's hard to adjust to. You know, sometimes when if you're, you're a beginning electrical engineer, you take a DC circuits class and all of a sudden you take my electromagnetics class wow all these rules change in fact as a general rule they're almost the opposite and that's how i tell people it's almost the opposite uh an example i give you know for again um we get graduate students that, that are ee majors but not electromagnetics majors i said think about it this way you think of a, a piece of aluminum foil Aluminum foil as a conductor. Right? Well, I ask, is it a conductor or is it an insulator? I think most people would say it's a conductor. Uh, it is for DC because most people think in terms of DC. Uh, but in RF, obviously it's a shield, right? You use aluminum foil to shield something in a Faraday cage. So it's really, it insulates RF. And I so you got to remember this. The other opposite is I give you a piece of wood. You could give it person is this an insulator or is this a conductor most people say well it's an insulator because you get an ohm meter across and dc it reads infinity but at rf it's a conductor well obviously it's a conductor we have homes and everything and we bring our radios in and the radio waves go right through it so it's almost directly the opposite and it's sometimes it's a hard um concept to grasp but if you can grasp that then you're a good uh, fundamentals of a good RF engineer. You can separate the two. So anyway, the Smith chart says, if you get a piece of transmission line, then you short circuit on one end, a quarter wave later, which is 180 degrees, it's an open circuit. And similarly, if you have a piece of coax and it's open on one end, well, it's open circuit. DC, it's infinity. No, it is not at RF. At DC, it is. At RF, an open circuit, if you go a quarter wave, it actually becomes a short circuit. It's hard to believe. Unless you know you get a good network analyzer and these little cool little things. You can uh, and we have a big one, of course, but now you know all my students can own one and we can they can go home and play with it. And you know, you let's see you can see a Smith chart on that, colored display, touch screen. 
under a hundred bucks. The one I have in the other room here is a 5062 Keysight. That cost the four four hundred no forty eight thousand dollars. Forty eight thousand. It's amazing that you can do this stuff these days like this. And I can give problem sets to my students, give them little magic black boxes without taking apart the box with a network analyzer. Tell me approximately what's inside there. And they can't. That's their assignment. Sometimes they'll hand out. Uh, sometimes it's a 200 ohm resistor. Sometimes it's a little inductor. And if they really understand the Smith chart and they understand my lectures, they'll come back and say, oh, Dr. Fong, that's an um, inductor of this value. Go, wow, that's very good. So that's what a network analyzer can do uh, without looking at what the component is. You can analyze and figure out what it is. But the, the important part is the middle is 50 ohms. Uh, the left represents zero ohms and the right represents infinity. But in this lecture, what we're saying is understand that a open circuit coax, a quarter wave of it will be a short circuit and a short circuit will be an open circuit. So like I'm looking into the, the room here. How many of you folks know that or have used that concept? Raise your hands. A few. Okay. Yeah. If, if you've played around antennas, it's a pretty good concept to, to understand. It's abstract, but it's a pretty good concept. So we use that here. So with that concept, let's explain it here. Maybe you'll get a better grasp of it. So you here's a regular dipole. In a regular dipole, you would have center fed it, right? I, I showed you that center feed, that old method. Does it work? Yeah, it works. It, it doesn't violate any E and M theory. It's a good way. Uh, it's a good way that we used to feed an antenna. But physically, it doesn't hold up. We've done this. That's why we had to get away from it. With that big arm there, the torque it causes. And that's the only way it works is with the arm at 90 degrees. Uh, it just doesn't hold up. It doesn't even hold up in a standard house. Up in a repeater, it gets torn apart. Strong winds. I mean, unless you, and people have built it with you know, welds. Yeah. If you can weld it with pipes and all that, but then it, it wouldn't become a mainstream design. We want to come with a mainstream design that hams can use that performs well and it will be long lasting. So here we believe this is the interesting configuration. So, okay, so you have this half wave dipole. We don't want to center feed it. That's just not practical. Electrically, it's okay, but it's not practical physically. So in a dipole, you have a low impedance in the middle. That's why you can feed it. But it's a high impedance at the ends. That's how it radiates. The, volt, the voltage is high at the ends of an antenna and the current's low, while in the middle of the antenna, the current is high and the voltage is low. So if at the ends of the antenna, the voltage is high and the current is low, that's another way of saying it's a high impedance. Or in the middle of a dipole, 60 ohms or so, 60, 65 ohms. Uh, but at the ends of a dipole, it's equivalently in the thousands of ohms. It's not infinity. I mean, you're never going to measure infinity, uh, but it's very high. It's very high. Ideally, it might be infinity in a vacuum and all that, but but on Earth, no. It's it's just very very high. But you can kind of assume round it off to infinity. So that's a high impedance point right there. So how do you match that? You need another high impedance point, right? If you were to feed it in the middle, it's you know, 50 ohm coax will do. But now. You're at the ends at several thousand ohms. How do you get to several thousand ohms? You go back to that quarter wave stub I just tried to convince you of. If you have a short circuit, short circuit, you go up a quarter wave. A quarter wave is 180 degrees in the Smith chart. It would be more or less an open circuit. Again, if you measured it with a network analyzer, no, it won't be infinity. It'll be in the thousands of ohms. That's good enough. RF, you just can't get infinity. It's not DC. So if you started with a short circuit transmission line, in this case, twin lead, it could be coax also, you go up about 60, actually 15 and a quarter and one and a quarter, 16 and a half inches. And you say, 16 and a half inches, why do you go up 16 and a half inches? Shouldn't it be about 18 inches, 18, 19? It should be. If it were in air, it would be 18, 19 inches. But we make it out of twin lead. And in twin lead, you know, it's the dielectric plastic. The dielectric plastic has what's called a velocity factor. It, it, in other words, it slows down, it's slower than the speed of light in air. If it was in air, this stub here would be about 18, 19 inches, but it's in twin lead. It's in, I'll show you, I don't know if you can see it or not. Here, I have one right here. It is 
in twin lead. Well, in twin lead, obviously twin lead is thicker than air. It slows down the speed of light by about oh, 15, 20%. So this all of a sudden in, in twin lead, lambda or wave, a quarter wave in twin lead is not 18 inches. It's about 16, in this case, 16 and a half inches. It's shorter, a little bit shorter. And where do you get that? Because it's a, a, a very fundamental antenna design formula. The speed of light always equal, has to always equal the frequency times wavelength, right? You probably remember that from your amateur radio exams. C, we call it C equals F lambda. The speed of light is always equal to the frequency times the wavelength. So the speed of light inside the twin lead is not three times 10 to the eighth meters a second. It's about 2.4, 2.6 times 10 to the eighth meters a second. So then therefore, the frequency doesn't change. So the, the wavelength, the actual dimensions of the wavelength is different. So a quarter wave in the twin lead is not six, or 18 inches or 19 inches. It's about in this twin lead. And it's going to vary. It's going to be 16 and a half inch, lot by lot, manufacturer by manufacturer. You have to trim it. You have to put it on a network analyzer. You have to put it on a network. And that's why we, we special order all our stuff. After a while, it was so difficult ordering from different batches and all that, that, uh, you know, if you buy a thousand foot roll, it's consistent usually, but if you buy it from a different run, you've got to recalibrate it. That's why we just have it all special order. It's just not worth our effort. So what happens is again, short circuit, right? If you short circuit, zero ohms. I've got to convince you that short circuit, zero ohms. And by the time it comes up here, according to Smith chart, right? You zero ohms, you move a quarter wave, which is 180 degrees around the Smith chart, it's going to read, the Smith chart says infinity. Well, again, not infinity, but very, very high. Very, very high. If you, if you did a, a deal design on paper and a computer, yes, it would be infinity. But in reality, as you go from zero ohms up to here, it'd be in the thousands of ohms, just right. The end of the dipole there, also in the thousands of ohms. So you've got a match. You have a transmission line match there, which is really nice. And then where do you get the 50 ohms? Remember, we're, we're 50 ohms. Well, if it's continuous, if it's zero ohms and this is infinity or close to it, several thousand, you must have passed 50 or close to 50 somewhere along the line. Well, it turns out, luckily, at about one, one and a quarter inch, again, you got a finder's tab. It, it might vary with different pieces of coax, but it'd be in this range. You figure that's a short circuit, that's an open. So 50 ohms is certainly closer to the short than the open. That, you know, the stuff we use at one, one and a quarter inches, it's pretty decent. Maybe not perfect, but very, very decent. You know, S offering SWRs of 1.2, 1.3 to 1, it's good enough. So that's how a basic dipole works. You get a quarter wave stub, stub because you need to match the 50 ohms to a high impedance. You want the high impedance because you want it end feed the dipole, not center feed it, but end feed it. And then the whole thing's vertical. Then you can just, like what I showed you, you can just hold it up. It withstands the uh, elements, the outdoor elements, far superior than just a vertical dipole. Okay, so if you understand that, let's move on here. So here's versions of it. People use this principle, built the twin lead version. Here's a copper J version. I Actually, we built this in our class. Got one right here. We build them and we test them and the students measure it. And the reason why we have them build this is because in this version, I'm sure a lot of you folks have this, or it's, it's pretty popular. Uh, I wouldn't recommend building it today. Uh, 20 years ago, this was great because copper was fairly cheap. Oh, this is $40 in copper pipe now. Maybe more. The last I checked was like $42. You need 20 feet of it at least because you chop it up. But the principles are the same. Here's the half wave radiator. Here's the quarter wave. That's the transmission line you build. The transmission line you build. So here's the short circuit. Here's the 50 ohm tap point. Now, does the antenna work? I mean, it's popular. Of course it works. Yeah. Otherwise, it wouldn't be popular. What it doesn't do is it doesn't do... Um, UHF 70 centimeters very well. Uh, but you said, Ed, you just said it, it will resonate as, as it, it's uh, harmonics. Well, the problem is the limits of the, remember I said the limits of the material, this is the limits of the transmission line. This doesn't act as a very good transmission line at uh, 
UHF. It's acceptable, barely acceptable at VHF. So you can set from remember, VHF, a quarter wave is about 18 inches. This is a little under two inches. So it's barely meeting the requirements of a reasonable transmission line. This has to be a transmission line uh, at VHF. Now, the twin lead was great because it's only a quarter inch spacing. That acts as a tr transmission line clear on up to five, 600 megahertz. This is only good for VHF and UHF. And then the other problem you run into is you got to hop across the tap for the 50 ohm tap. That's almost two inches. You can't expose UHF two inches and not think you're going to get losses. All right, that's two inches. It's, it's going to start radiating. And it's not shielded. So this design is, you know, we have it. It, it works pretty well for VHF. I won't say it's optimized. It works pretty well. You'll be happy with it if you built it. Uh, again, I wouldn't recommend it because by the time you put the copper end caps, you've got these T's, you've got these uh, elbows. It's about $40, probably more these days in the materials. Copper is just very, very expensive. But it, you know, if you want to learn about antennas, it does work. Uh, and, but the, it will not do UHF. Now, to solve the UHF problem, we, we bought the Arrow antenna. The Arrow has another solution for the UHF. And we have. We don't build this. We bought this. This, this is kind of hard. This is kind of hard to build, but but you need you know fifty sixty dollars. You can buy them. Fairly rugged. It's the one with ready rod. Sorry, use yes. Fine for mechanics. You guys have who has one? You have one. I did mine in ready, with ready rod instead of aluminum. Oh, what kind of rod? Ready rod is a thread, thread, threaded rod from a, the hardware store. Oh, really? So yeah. you built it then? Yeah, I built. We built a bunch of them at another ham pub. We built five of them, and they all tested out uh, SWR wise and stuff. Fine. Yeah, SWR wise, you can get them. Okay, it's decent, right? Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's... The VHF, it's great. The UHF, not quite so much. Exactly. That's ex you took it out of my words. <laughs> <laughs> yes. So we tested this out. We build it. Building it is pretty. Hard. When you say building it is pretty hard, I mean it's a lot of work building this thing correctly. It, it, I give you credit for building it because we bought it. I said fifty bucks. I'm not going to build this. I just buy it. <laughs> uh, it's pretty hard. I mean, I I give these guys at Arrow some credit because you know you got to machine parts and all this. So it works like this. Here's the VHF section. And here's the matching. So the transmission line is pretty far, but yeah, it does work at VHF. Okay. You compare it to ours, it doesn't work quite as well. Uh, you know, we've just optimized ours like crazy with simulations. And you know, no antenna manufacturer would have the resources, but I got cheap graduate students that could do all kinds of things. <laughs> <laughs> I, think I, lost coax. I mean, they love it. When I say, Let's try this coax versus this coax just for the feed line. You know, how many antenna does manufacturers uh, let's try this manufacturer coax so we find these how about since i know a coax manufacturing why don't we talk to the guy and make coax this way because they learn something how do you get lower loss in coax and they made us a sample and this it buys time i need materials in my classes and we were testing it and the coax we use a special made coax it improves it at vhf probably not a whole lot of difference but UHF, oh, probably quarter to a half dB better. Because if you have bad coax, as you know, at UHF, it makes a big difference. So I'll explain the coax, later, how we make this custom coax. In fact, if you guys buy some antennas, I'll send some of this coax to you, and you'll cut it up. And say, yes, it is not the same as Belton. But I'll explain why. I talked to the Belton folks. I know you guys probably don't know Steve Lampin. He's the, he was the VP of Western Regional Sales here in the U.S. And we understand this. Uh, the coax, the one we made is purely optimized for low loss. That's all it is. It's not as rugged. We'll get into this later. But anyway, so how does this antenna work? Clever. I think it's clever. I, they probably have a patent. It. Here's the VHF section. And probably they knew the VHF section has a low impedance for UHF, but it has that terrible pattern, right? It has that pattern. They know they're not stupid at Arrow. They have easy neck. You know, it's a free software. Why not use it? That 75% of the energy goes up into the sky. They knew this. So what they did was 
they paralleled a UHF stub to it. So the UHF portion is this J pole. Here's the radiating element, and here's the feed point. That is a UHF J pole. This element and that element is the VHF J pole. And why does the UHF perform so so? Here's why. It does it at a single feed point. So the single feed point, when you feed a VHF signal, yes, it goes through here. The VHF signal will not resonate with the UHF section here. But when you feed a UHF signal, it sees a low impedance at UHF from this section and also this section. So with a little bit of hand waving, you can say if the matching is the same at VHF and UHF, that means half the power, half the UHF signal will go in here, which is the improper antenna, but the other half will go into the proper antenna. So have they made a little gain here? Yes, they have. Half the energy that you put into the feed point here is going into the right antenna, but the other half is still going into the wrong antenna. So you end up improving this pattern uh, by quite a bit. You probably get not more, at least uh, at least twice the energy going here, at least. But still, you still have those lobes. Not as great by half, half of where they were at, half. So that's an improvement. But what they really need to do is totally isolate this piece at UHF. And only have this piece. And we believe, well, I know, we did it. The design I'm going to present to you is easy to construct, much easier to construct than what you guys did. Because, yeah, that, that's a, it's a lot of work. Again, I chose to, for 50 bucks, I'll give you the $50, and I'd rather have my students just evaluate it. And then there's another version of the j antenna, which is called the Slim Jim. So that's just nothing, if you really analyze it, that's nothing more than just a j pole with, if it's made of twin lead, you tie the ends together to some rumor. I don't know who started this, that you get 6 dB gain out of it. You do not get 6 dB gain. The good news is you don't harm it in any way. It, it, the, the two elements are too close. And it all from all the tests and simulations. And Larry Siebick, he's passed away now. He did a lot of tests because he looked at this. There's no way that's going to give 6 dB. Of course there's no way because it doesn't give 6 dB. It's just, but, but, you know, the thing is, if you build it this way, with that connected, it doesn't seem to hurt it. The pattern is pretty much the same. We've tested this, and um, I would agree that. Uh, so if you if you build what's called a slim gym, uh, it does not do dual band, but for a single band, it works fine. But it doesn't give you six dB. It might give you six dB over a rubber dot, but not over. You know, when I read the, and it's not an AWRL, I read the internet stuff. You, know, you tie this together. It, it gives you the impression it gives you 6 dB over not tying it. No, it does not do that. It does not do that. Nothing's that simple. So in order to get 4 or 5 dBs out of it, I've got to talk on it, make how to make a collinear. It's a lot more complex than that. So let's see what else I have here. Okay, so how did we do it? How did we do it? Now that you've been sitting for half an hour, uh, you're ready for the trick. How, how, fundamentally, how did we do it? So hopefully I've laid the, the good foundations for the standard J-pole. So now I can explain this and perhaps I've given you enough background where you can understand this. So the quarter wave matching stub at the bottom stays the same. And uh, here, let me draw you the waveform. Again, it's a short circuit at the bottom of a quarter wave stub. And it's a high impedance at about 16 and a half inches, at 16 and a half inches, because that's a quarter wave at, in the twin lead. It would be, if you were doing an air, it would be about 18. So how does the waveform look when you drive this? Well, obviously, a short circuit's got to be zero volts, and it's very high current then. And as you go up this quarter wave stub, it becomes a high impedance. High impedance says high voltage, low current. So if you were to actually send a signal here, get a, a AC voltmeter, and move it along this line, it would be obviously zero down here. It's a short. If you move it along the line, you'll get a high, a high voltage reading, just like the end of the at the end of a dipole antenna. You know, you'll get a high voltage reading. So same here. If, if you measure the voltage, it goes from zero to the max, whatever that is, at a quarter wave. So what happens at UHF? What happens at UHF? Why does it match at UHF? Why is it when you ever, ever every time you add a half wavelength, you get 
uh, an impedance match. You know, why is it that a 100 megahertz antenna works at 300, 500, 700? That's because if you understand the Smith chart, you are going around once around the circle. In other words, if you look back at the Smith chart, and I don't expect all of you to understand this, a Smith chart represents every time you go 180 degrees, it represents a quarter wave and another 180 degrees, another quarter wave. So what it says is every time you move a half wave, you're back at where you started from. That's shown right here. You start out with a short. If you move a quarter wave, this is that UHF, a quarter wave will be about, oh, four inches in this case, three and a half inches or so. You move up three and a half inches. You get a peak, so right there. You move another quarter wave, you get a minimum. And you need move another quarter wave. It's a different phase now, but we're not worried about phase here. You get a peak. Ah, good. You get a peak right there again. That's where you get the resonance at work. The SWR is just fine. You reach a peak there. So for matching, you're fine. It's a three half wavelength matching element for UHF, but it's a quarter wave for VHF. So we never said the matching was a problem because that's why when folks use a VHF antenna and UHF, they measure the SWR. Looks good. It was a pattern problem. So let's take at UHF, you got a match. And at UHF, what you would like to see, you'd like to see about 11 to 12 inches, right? That's a half wave at UHF, right? Five, six inches for a rubber duck. And you need about 11 or 12 inches for half wave. So at exactly or approximately a half wave, 11 to 12 inches, you know, depending, again, depending on where you operate in the band, you would like to cut off. Because you have this totally cut off, you will get the half wave pattern. If you did this, you would get that nice half wave pattern. But then what would you do with VHF? If you cut it off, then you just have a UHF antenna. How do you get VHF out of this antenna? Because certainly the stub will match, but you don't have an antenna. So what you do is you add this four and a quarter wave inch, four and a quarter, four and a half, depending on what frequency you want. That's the quarter wave for coax, a quarter wave at UHF. It's not five inches or five, five and a half inches. That's in air. This is in coax. And in coax, again, you have what's called a velocity factor. The wave does not travel at the speed of light. It travels about maybe 20, 30% below it. So it's going to be shorter. So it turns out to be about four and a quarter, four and a half inches, depending on where you want it to be. But you short it on one end. If you short it on one end, then the other end would be an open circuit, according to the Smith chart. If it's just a short on one end, it's going to be an open on the other. So when you place this on top of this, here's the shield, and here's the center conductor. At UHF, it looks into this, what does it see? Infinity. Well, that's exactly what you want to see. So that the wave, the UHF wave, doesn't continue. Because if it weren't for this, you know, if it was for the regular... For the regular J pole, you, you go up, you know, 11, 12 inches here at UHF, it still sees wire. So the current starts continuing. So when it continues, what happens? It goes up, it pulls the wave up. That's where you get those lobes going into the sky. You would want to just cut off. If you could cut this off at 12 inches or 11, 12 inches, it'll work great as a UHF antenna. That's what this does. At UHF, it sees a high impedance. But at VHF, it's not resonant. It's that that's four and a quarter is only valid. This is only valid for UHF. It's not valid for VHF. So VHF, it doesn't see a resonant stub. It sees the entire half wave. Eleven. If you add up eleven and a quarter, four and a quarter, seventeen, it's about what, 36, 37 and a half inches. That's exactly a half wave. So let me. Ask for a show of hands here. Looking into the audience there. Did it, can you guys follow that? Raise your hands if you follow it. Oh, good. Most of you follow that. Raise your hands if you've seen this explanation before. None. Good. You learned something. That's good. So it works. I'm, I, I, I tried a lot of different ways of trying to get dual band. I put a little coil there. And I'm, it, it, you know, you might get the matching's not the problem. 
the problem was the performance. And I tell you, it's a lot of work because how well does your antenna actually work? You have to get a spectrum analyzer, you know, 50 yards away and measure it. Does this technique work? This technique actually works. When we actually measure it, it actually gives a pretty good waveform. You know, it gives this waveform at both VHF and UHF. And pretty close. I mean, as far as our instruments are concerned, it's pretty close. And when people use this technique, so yeah, it does work. So we ended up, oh, so you see how this version works. So one of my students says, why don't you put this all up in a, instead of putting it in a PVC pipe, why don't you just have it all in a roll up? And we did. Uh, you can, it's kind of interesting how we do it with heat shrinkable tubing and it all holds the one piece. And we have it come out in a piece of coax RG174. And again, uh, let me take a few minutes off to discuss this RG174. So we worked with this Chinese manufacturer because, because I wanted our antenna to be really, really optim, optimized for a UHF. And a lot of it is in the coax. And you use RG58, the losses are pretty high. And when I looked into this, what's, what's the lowest possible loss configuration you can make in coax, regardless of anything else? <clears throat> now, I'm saying Belden cannot do it this way. Uh, they, they, Steve, those guys, they understand exactly what we did. We, we order special coax, and I'm not so sure you can sell it this way. If you take our RG174 that we use for our roll-up antenna, and we make a little extension because it's, it's designed as a portable emergency antenna, all fits in a little Ziploc bag. We include a six feet extension. We include adapters for SMA, BNC, SMA, male and female. It's, it's an emergency antenna, not designed. I tell folks, no, you don't put this outside for a winter and think it will survive. It won't. It's not designed for that. It's designed for weekend camping or emergencies. So it's not designed to have a very long shelf life, but it's designed to have good performance. The coax we had to make was the shield is not woven, right? Most coax, you know, when you open it up, the shield is woven. It's woven for a reason, so that it gets 100% coverage. So, and you can bend it, and it's all woven. Well, when you weave it and you analyze this on a network analyzer, you get a lot more losses at UHF. And VHF is probably not that much of a difference. You can measure, and HF certainly, whether it's woven or not woven. It's just like you're flowing water, right? If, you, if you're if you flowing water through a pipe, you're going to lose pressure if it's woven, if something's woven. But imagine it just being straight straight copper, straight wire, no weaving. Oh, of course you'll get higher frequency response. You know, again, waves is like water. You get a lot less resistance. So we experimented with this. Send me a piece of coax that's just purely straight uh, uh uh, woven wire or not unwoven wire for the uh, transmission line and yeah oh yeah much lower loss but then you can't bend it right it'll clump it'll start clumping so what they did is they came up with the, the uh, dielectric it's a gooey dielectric so with some glue in it and also about every 10 centimeters we weave it once every 10 centimeters we weave it weave it weave it and in the end it provides much lower loss well i'm not, I'm not saying much it's Clearly lower loss than standard RG174. Uh, what's the disadvantage? Pure copper wire. That's the other thing. If you open up coax, most of the stuff is nickel plated. Why? So it doesn't corrode over time. Copper will oxidize over time. So the lowest loss possible coax is this smooth. No, you don't braid it. Insulation smooth. And instead of nickel plated copper, if you open our coax, it's pure copper. Uh, would it oxidize? It probably will. That's why we say this is not a permanent antenna. Um, now, in this is for our roll-up. It's for emergencies and it's for performance. So it's straight weave, straight weave with some ties every 10 centimeters, and it's not nickel plated. So yeah, it does get better performance, but it'll oxidize. Plus, if you probably if you bend it a lot and everything. The shielding will get lost. It'll start clumping. Now, they, uh, it's not that bad, I don't think, because the, the dielectric they use has a slight uh, adhesive to it. But yeah, it will clump. You can't just go bending it back and forth because regular coax is woven. It's very durable. So that's why. So that's why when you use our coax, it is lower loss. You just got to be careful. You just have to, you know, in engineering, you just have to understand what's going on and how to use it and what it's designed for, you know, what its limitations are. 
Uh, so again, if you do the uh, base station antenna, where the here, where the antenna goes into the PVC pipe, because then it's protected. Then it's very well protected. It has to transmit through the PVC pipe. Again, that slows down the speed of light. And you'll find that the one that's rolled up that's designed in air, if you measure the two, the one that's operating in air is about two inches longer. Two inches longer. Because C is equal to F lambda. At three, and one is the speed of light in air, and one is the speed of light with the PVC pipe covering it. And it slows down by nah, about 5% or so. Maybe 3 to 5%. It's shorter. It definitely has to be shorter for it to resonate. And we find that even the PVC pipe is very critical of what you use. Uh, again, one of my graduate students looked at this, that the Lowell's, the low, stuff you pick up at Lowell's, item number 23990 works the best. The lowest loss. And it's not that expensive. Okay. So we're getting to the end of this talk. How about measurements? So you get a good spectrum analyzer. This is a Keysight 8591. And sure enough, it does work. It works in practice, and when you actually measure it, here it is, the a two meter, a standard two meter J-pole at UHF. Here's where it operates at UHF now. That's just a, re a reference good plot. We've adjusted everything so you can see it well. But if you use our antenna at UHF with that modified stub, you get about six dB back. You get it almost, almost exactly as predicted. Six dBs is a lot, by the way. If you guys are engineers, that's 6 dB. That's four times the performance. All of a, you know, put it this way. If you use a two-meter JPO or, or even ground plane at UHF, losing 6 dB is like your Baofeng walkie-talkie. You put it at four watts or any walk at four watts. You you use a two-meter antenna at UHF. You, it's just the same as it at one watt. You lose 75% of the energy. So you, you really want to operate with an antenna that operates at true UHF. And if you actually make measurements, you actually make measurements out of her, it works. I mean, that's just a single shot. So the master's thesis here, right? We've got to come up with ideas for master's thesis. How do you measure antennas? When you actually submit a performance of an antenna to like the National Institute of Standards and Technologies, their basic recommendation is you just can't take one measurement. That's why you see all these bogus measurements. Oh, we measured it and it did this. And then they stop. They take the best measurement. No, it's a little bit more complex than that. For an antenna, what you really want to measure is at least five measurements, but more than that. It's got to be at three different situations for an antenna on a rainy day, a foggy day, and then in a regular clear day. And then you take the averages of them. And we find that if you do that, yes, I would say the simulations that you simulate with and design with come pretty close. If not, it's your antenna design, you're building it, there's a problem with it. But when everything's working right, yes, it will come very close. And here's the numbers we get. This is So it's 15 measurements on each of these entries. But now that each 15 is five is on a rainy day, five is on an overcast day, foggy day, and five is on a clear day. And so, so this is just a relative measurement. Minus 24.7 dB with a standard quarter wave ground plane, basically. And we did this in a parking lot on a Sunday, so there's not as many cars or hardly any cars in the case that we did it. Sunday, bring out your network analyzer, start measuring, and you say, why would you do that? Well, students love to do this stuff. They love to experiment. They, they actually don't like, they don't go into engineering because they like the theory. You go into physics if you like the theory. You mm -hmm. like to build things. So yeah, yeah, Sunday morning, you can get students doing, especially if their their grades dependent on it, right? And so we did this measurement, minus 24.7. Just We could have normalized that to zero, but I, I think just leaving it at minus 27.4. A rubber duck in the same situation or close to the same situation, you lose about 6 dBs. It is true. A rubber duck is lousy at VHF. If you're talking to a repeater, short range, you're fine, but its performance is worse than a quarter wave antenna. A VHF J-pole is better than a ground plane, quarter wave. Uh, not by much, maybe a dB, dB and a half. Yeah, it's not by much, but but, but you probably notice it if you use a, a, a J-pole configuration. Again, it's not night and day, but enough to notice. 
And our dual band J pole is like a regular J pole with, within 0.1 dB. It's within 0.1 dB because we added some stuff to it. Um, that stuff. So it maybe it looks like it does lose 0.1 dB, but that's that's really negligible. You'll never hear that. It's just that we have equipment that can measure that. And again, you have to take 15 measurements too. And that comes out. It's pretty much in the noise. Now, how about at uh, UHF? At the UHF, uh, again, same experiment. Uh, you use a UHF quarter wave antenna minus 38.8 dBs. And now with a rubber duck, rubber duck, you don't lose as much because in a rubber duck at UHF, you know, it's, it's, they're usually five, six inches, close to a quarter wave. But then uh, what you get the losses from is you don't have a good ground plan. You don't get, you know, it's just walkie talkie that depending on the ground, uh, you don't have a resonant ground in, antenna. So you lose a few dBs. A good one, you probably won't lose as much, but typically you lose you know, two to three dBs. So rubber duck doesn't work as well as a good resonant antenna, but not bad. Not like in, at VHF, you lose six dBs. That, that's very noticeable. And you guys probably notice that, right? When compared to put a ground plane antenna and then your rubber duck, a well, big difference. But at UHF, there is a difference, but it's not as major. Now, a standard J pole uh, at UHF, now it's terrible. Again, you see this on that plot, but if you take 15 measurements, it's still terrible. That's not not a not a quark plot. There it is. You take fifteen measurements, it loses a sixty six to seven dBs. That's a lot. Six to seven dBs is a lot. Uh, but if you use our configuration, just a little clever stub that I think, if you're diligent enough, you can do it. You know, the good network analyzer can be done, or else you can buy from us. If you want a reference design, you can just buy from us because we've worked on this a lot. Uh, I mean, it's probably more the materials that we use that really makes a big difference to make sure that you write the right coax, you get the right twin lead and all that. Um, it all comes back. You get a, you, you, At UHF, our technique is like a UHF quarter wave, and that's really what you want. So let's see. So here's our lab here. This is the original when we did it back in 2008 or so. You notice that's the 8753. We, we still have that. Nobody uses it anymore. We still have it. That well, I paid, you know, back then instruments were very expensive. We paid like eighty eight eighty eight thousand dollars for that back then. Uh, really expensive a network analyzer. So we got the new one here is a fifty sixty two. Does the same thing. The good thing is it has a um, USB interface and it's really based on Windows. So, you know, there's, there's actually a computer back here. This one has no computer. Uh, it's all dedicated uh, processing circuitry. Uh, well, this one's really a PC with a hard drive back there. And then the front panel is all the RF stuff that interfaces to it. So it interfaces directly to a PC and cheaper too. And it's like 48,000, I think we paid for this. That's, and then see the Nano right there, under a hundred bucks. It, it virtually does 90% of what this does. Probably not as precision, but you know, for most uses, it's fine. Okay, so Okay, coming to the end of this talk here, you guys are probably getting pretty tired and it's finally warming up here. Uh, so this, a lot of people question the stub. So when we measure the stub, you're right. At resonance, this is at 445, it is not infinity. It's at a few thousand ohms. That's why I said a few thousand, but it, the principle still works. You know, to get a stub at to be open circuit, it's really tough. Yeah, it's coax is lossy. That's the losses you're measuring. And then, you know, I see how stable is that stub? I put my hands around and everything. It's pretty, it varies, but not at resonance. When it's resonating, it's pretty consistent. So that stub is pretty consistent. Not infinity, but certainly not short or not 50 ohms. It's way up there. It's good enough. Oh, and then you wonder about how is it at 146 megahertz? At 146 megahertz, it looks like this, almost an open circuit. Slightly inductive, that you would expect that. <coughs> Almost an open circuit. Here's, here it is. It's sweeping from 30 megahertz to one gig. So it doesn't matter where the other places are. But at 146, it's pretty much an, uh, a piece of wire because a wire in midair looks like that. And see, here's how it hangs up. This thing's been up for 20 years. If you feed it at the bottom, it's only vertical gravity. There's no R cross F gravity torque. So there's no uh, tension on this. And so it, it's a very good way of mounting an antenna. And the only disadvantage is it's pretty tall. You know, it's three one quarter wavelengths tall. Our ground plane is shorter, but, it, but if you make it out of PVC pipe, it's all round. 
it's hard to even see this thing blow in the wind. It's all rounds. It's very aerodynamically designed. And you have all round it. There's no wind load, so it doesn't bend in the wind. And we, you know, I didn't test it, but I know FEMA tested this technique. 150 miles per hour, it just holds up because it's all round. It's just aerodynamically designed. See, here's here's the roll up. Here's the antenna itself. Here's the six feet extension. You know, these are custom extensions with that low loss coax I was talking about with a male BNC in one end and a female in the other. We include the adapter. So you just kind of connect this end to this end and you get another six feet. And you can connect nah, two of these together and you'll still be okay. By three, the loss is at UHF start getting high. But at VHF, you probably connect two or three of them together, get 15, 20 feet, hollowed up a tree for an emergency. And again, it comes with all the connectors. Let's see. So we have other talks. Uh, if you like this one, how you get gain, how you actually get gain out of a collinear. That's another 40-minute talk or so. And then the tri-band talk, how you get tri-bands. So very clever. Took us some time to get the 220 megahertz band out of it. Uh, oh, I don't sell these. These are interesting radios, we think. Uh, these, these, these Chinese radios, they're pretty good. We give these raffle prizes. They'll do the, you know, the three bands, dual band. If you think people say the radios are too expensive, you know, these Baofengs. This is the Baofeng tri-band for 60 bucks. The dual band one you buy for $25 on Amazon. And these mobiles are, you know, they work fine. We give them away with raffle prizes. And uh, I'm amazed that the Chinese can do it. Um, the only thing we change in real life is what you'll see here. Uh, we used to design this antenna. We used to design this, this last, you know, we say, here's the last 17 inches twin lead. In reality, you don't need this piece. <clears throat> when twin lead was cheap, it didn't matter. It was almost this price of wire, it didn't matter. Now, you notice we delivered the antenna like this, but this last piece is it's just a, a 17 inch piece of number 18 or 60, I forget. I think it's 18 wire, number 18. Then that's only about 10 cents. If you did it in twin lead, it's probably like 40 cents for that piece. It doesn't so, matter, right? All, all, all that is is the last 17 inch piece for the, for the VHF section. That was just a cost factor design change. Yeah, yeah, it does not change the performance, performance at all. No, no. We tested that. It does not change the performance one bit. It shouldn't, right? All that was, it, it's just the last piece, you know, in a standard. Look at these guys. They don't have twin lead. It's just a piece of conductive rod here. It could be conductive wire. Now, whether you add a little piece or it doesn't matter. The, the 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 reason why these guys did this this way is because you build the whole thing out of one twin lead. So you get that leftover piece. You get that leftover piece on this side. It, it, and that's what this is. But it doesn't matter, right? You can just put just put a piece of wire. If this if this is going into a PVC pipe, you might as well just put a piece of wire and save yourself 30, 40 cents. And that's a lot. You know, when you make these things in the thousands, you save 30, 40 cents. That's quite a bit. Now we don't do that. Obviously, we don't do that in the roll-up. The roll-up is all one piece, all one piece of twin lead. We cut these notches and then we cover them with heat shrinkable tubing so it holds together. Question. Uh, no, go ahead. I, I'm going to make a presumption here that the RG174 is phase stable. Is phase stable? Correct. Is it no, it is not. Coax cannot be phase stable. Of course, it changes phase as the wavelength goes. Yeah. It has to change phase. That's how E and M works. I'm talking in, flex, in a flex state. If you flex it, you change the distance between the center conductor and the outer. Oh, no, 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 it, that doesn't change enough. No, no, no. Okay. It's like any coax. It's just that if you flex it a lot because we don't, um, it's not woven. Okay. Then the, the coax would start uh, leaning, you know, it'll, it'll start getting open. So, you know, let me get I, here. It's right. I, here. I'm making a reference towards Heliax type cables. Yeah, it's not Heliax, it's still got yeah. a dielectric. Here it is. It's still got a dielectric. So you might do that. It's not going to hurt it. But if you keep on doing it, maybe. Uh, it but they hurt. make the dielectric a little gooey and sticky. So it should last. I think more of concern is it's pure copper. It's not nickel plated. So if you left it out over time, it would possibly get oxidized and moisture would get into it. But we left it copper because copper, again, uh, is lower loss for UHF than nickel plated. 
I've got one comment yet, and you I kind of highlighted how multidisciplinary engineering is. It's not just electrical engineering. You've got chemistry involved here, chemical science, some physics as far as strength and materials. And and mechanical, you, right? You just highlighted all these different areas of engineer, different engineering facets that come together is very multidisciplinary. Yeah, to make a, a you just the highlight the principles. You're right. The principles is electrical. Yes. But to actually get one working and working right in the field is from testing to mechanical to materials. Yeah, you're right. That's good because that's my, my my daughter has her master's in mechanical. I mean mechanical, I ask her. You have to have these resources. Even something as simple as an antenna. Uh, the right. antenna again, it starts as E and M from an electrical point of view, but actually implementing all this stuff and uh, yeah. understanding materials and yeah, it's to, to get a good product working, it's a multidisciplinary uh, practice for sure. Well, thank you, Ed, for your time. You're we're, very welcome. We're at the end and of it's our warming up here. We appreciate uh, appreciate your time. You're very welcome. And yeah, I'll, I'll Sean, I'll send you a spreadsheet and you can circulate. It could take months. Don't worry about it. I mean, okay. check it off. All I want is a, a summary sheet of what you guys want to order. And again, the price is really, really good. And yeah. uh, we don't offer this. It's only as a club offer are those okay. prices valid for. It's not valid for you, dude. If you email me, then we have to give it to you at the regular price. Okay. That sounds okay. Good. Hey, you guys have a good afternoon there now. It's afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. you guys take care. Hands, hands. 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 Hands.